this practical, the first step is to prepare a standard solution. So this is part of required practical one, and it's part of Lewis, is just remembering how to do this properly. So I've set up the balance here, check that it's level, and press tear on the balance. Then I'm going to take a weighing boat. It's an empty weighing boat, like so, and record the mass. So that's coming out as 2.75 grams, so 2.75 plus or minus 0 0.01 grams because it's a 0 0.002 dp balance. Then I need to add some solid to it. The method says between 9.5 and 10.5 grams. So the first thing to do is to remove the weighing boat from the top of the balance. Now that's important because if I spill any of this compound on the top of the balance, it would get weighed alongside the balance, uh, alongside the solid being transferred, but it actually would never be transferred. So that would increase the procedural error massively. And in fact, that's not really a procedural error, it's just a mistake, it's just poor practice. So I did just one spatula load, so I can see what that looks like. So that's 4.36 grams already. So another spatula load in a tiny bit, and we should be in the correct range. So I've got another spatula load and a tiny bit. Remember I was, oh, hang on a second there, I need to add the 2.75 grams onto that. So I'm at 5.69 grams, uh, I need the 2.75 plus about 10, so that's about 12.75, so I need a few more spatulas, that makes a bit more sense. So one, two, and three, so I'm aiming for about 12.75-ish, maybe a little bit less, 11.06, another, Bit. See how we go. That's a little bit too much this time, so I'll take a bit of that off. And we're at 12.77 grams, which is perfect, that's well within the range. So 12.77 plus or minus 0 0.01 um, grams there. Then take that weighing boat, pour that solid straight into a clean and dry beaker and then reweigh the weighing boat in case there's any residue stuck to that. And that mass is 2.76 grams, so 2.76 plus or minus 0 0.01 grams. So now I can calculate accurately the mass of the solid which was transferred to the beaker. Now it's important to remember that the aim of a standard solution is that we need to know its concentration incredibly accurately. So every last tiny little bit of that solid that's ended up in the beaker here has to get transferred into the flask over there. I'm going to start off by diluting, oh sorry, dissolving this in some distilled water. So add some distilled water. I'm going to go for about uh, 100 centimetres cubed or so. So I'm actually going to take the top off here, being careful not to pollute the stem of this by holding on to it and just pour it in because it's a lot faster. And pop that back on there so that it doesn't get contaminated in any way. Take a clean glass rod and stir it. So I'm adding distilled water and stirring until all of the solid has dissolved. So it's important to stir until all of that solid has dissolved. the stirring rod into the beaker like so. So I'm just going to rinse that off. Oops. Get it my proper. Rinse that beak, the stirring rod into the beaker. So any of the moles of the compound that were stuck to the stirring rod are now inside that beaker. The next thing to do then is to take a funnel, my clean funnel here, pour that solution into the funnel, into the volumetric flask. This one's a 250 centimetres cubed volumetric flask. So, and then rinse the beaker. So I'm transferring with rinsings the solution of the compound. Okay, so transferring with plenty of rinsings the solution that I made. So to summarise so far, first things first, weigh by difference. So weigh by difference was where I took the weighing boat, added the solid, recorded the total mass, transferred the solid, took the weighing boat with the residue and, and took the mass of that and then the difference is the exact mass of that solid that's been transferred so that's weighing by difference then dissolve the solid completely so add distilled water stir well until all of the solid has dissolved transfer that solution with washings with rinsings into the volumetric flask and finally make up that solution to the graduation mark i'm going to do that 
with sulfuric acid for this. And that's a particular feature of this experiment. Normally, it'd just be distilled water. In this experiment, it's important to acidify, so topping it like so. I'm topping it up until it just about reaches the neck of that flask, where it's going to move a lot more quickly. Just put that to one side out of the way. And then I'm going to take a drop and pipette to just top that up so that the bottom of the meniscus just sits on the line. So I'm making this up to the graduation mark with, uh, sorry, with um, sulfuric acid even, with sulfuric acid in this example. So it's just topping it up until the bottom of the meniscus just sits on the line. Like so. And the final step is to stop the flask and invert that several times to make sure that the concentration is the same throughout. That's part one of this experiment done. So here's the solution that we made up containing iron 2 and it's the iron 2 part of that compound which reacts in the redox titration. For a redox titration, the apparatus is really just the same as an acid-base titration. Uh, but as you will see in a few moments' time, the reagent in the burette, the potassium manganate 7, changes colour itself during the redox reaction, and therefore no indicator is used. So that's about the only difference. So to start off with, I've made sure I've got that, that uh, solution that we made up last time, and I've made sure it's been inverted several times so that it's the same concentration all of the way through. I'm going to pour a little bit of that into a beaker because it's much easier to pipette from a beaker, but also if I have a disaster and knock the beaker over and spill it, I've still got some solution. Whereas if that happens with the flask, then you might have to just start all over again, which is not great. So I'm taking a pipette. Uh, I'm going to, I've already added the safety filler to it, so I'm going to just pop that in there. I haven't rinsed it yet, so I'll just take the screw and remove that filler. Carefully, uh, give that a good rinse around in the solution that we're using and empty down the sink. Like so. And then pop that safety filler back on, so keeping the hand nice and close to the end of the filler like that. Now notice that I'm wearing gloves for this titration. There's not a massive chemical um, reason to wear the gloves in terms of chemical hazards specifically but this stuff is a bit messy and if it gets on your skin it does stain your skin for a few days so i usually recommend just wearing a pair of gloves just to keep yourself um, avoiding that stained skin it does however make this bit a bit more tricky with the with the pipetting so i'm going to just make sure that the gloves nice and tight on my thumb push up switch that filler and then it's back to normal bend your knees make sure that your eyes are at the right level just watching the bottom of the meniscus, and as soon as it sits just on that line, stop the flow and let it out into a conical flask. Like so. so I'm just letting this drain into a conical flask, um, and I'm going to make sure that I've got a wash bottle to hand as well as usual in the titration, but unusually this time, once I've allowed this to drain into the conical flask, I'm going to add some dilute sulfuric acid to the conical flask. Now the dilute sulfuric acid does not need to be pipetted and it does not need to be a particular concentration because it's just there to provide H plus ions to drive that redox reaction in the correct way. Drop that onto the surface, remember to touch the surface and lay it flat and that's now a nice accurate 25 centimetres cubed but it's all there safe, just like there. Um, so I've got some 0.5 moles per centimetre cubed sulfuric acid. I'm just going to take a 25 centimetre cube measuring cylinder and add somewhere around 25 centimetre cube. It really does not need to be very accurate. As long as it's in a good excess, that's fine. Um, it, it will not change the, the mole ratio between the Fe2 plus ions and the MnO4 minus ions at all, as long as there's enough of it there. The next challenge then is to read the burette, and that's quite difficult with this very dark coloured solution inside it. So sometimes it's easier to read the top of the meniscus than the bottom in this case. It doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent on this. So the meniscus reading, 
I'm reading the bottom of the most goes 1.50 uh, centimetres cubed there. So 1.50 centimetres cubed is that meniscus reading. Like so. Uh, pop the flask underneath like that. And I'm going to swirl it with my right hand and add this solution with my left. Now, hopefully, what you should see is the colour change. So this very deep purple solution is instantly changing to a very, very pale green, but for all intents and purposes, colourless solution, as it reacts with the Fe2 plus um, in that solution. So keep swirling and keep swirling and keep swirling that until we get a first permanent pink colour. Now that first permanent pink colour maybe takes a while to appear. Uh, it looks as if it's maybe getting a bit closer, so I might just turn that down a little bit so you can see it better. The reason that there's a first permanent pink colour is because one drop extra of this manganate solution will turn that solution pink. Now with the manganate being so colourful, you can see already that there's splashes of that at the side. But I'm going to actually rinse that down now so that those um, bits of manganate end up in the bottom of that flask. But then continue to add that solution nice and carefully, swirl it away like in every titration you've ever done before until that first permanent pink colour. Like that. And off it goes. And so the final value on this first rough titration, 27.00 centimetres cubed. 27.00 centimetres cubed. And then you do the same as you would in any other titration. So empty that out, rinse the flask, refill with another aliquot of the 25.0 centimetres cubed of the Fe2 plus solution, achieve concordancy, and then work backwards to do that.